recording. So today's lecture is one of the least exciting, but maybe most uh, useful. This is just on background tools we'll be using. It's about project management. Then next week, we'll start in on design tools. And then the week after that, we'll get in the lab and start making things. So for this week's lecture, there's two assignments. One is to work through a Git tutorial. And if you're not familiar, one of the main things I'll do now is explain Git. Git is a version control system, and it's what we're going to be using to manage content. You're going to build websites, you're going to design hardware and software. All of that content is managed through Git, which I'll explain. And then the second thing you need to do is build a site and describe yourself and a possible final project. And I've got linked here. Um, three examples of sites. Uh, e each of these are sites and each one, the one I picked are in particular, each of them have nice pages on thoughts on this class. Um, and so you can use those as examples and, and they're both interesting background. So, uh, Let's see, and then let me do one other thing that I'll explain. Uh, right now I'm in GitLab and I'll explain in the next hour about GitLab and Git. Um, there's a site, which is the main website. It has what's called an issue tracker. And I'm gonna start an issue, which is um, sign agreements. And so in this issue, what I'm then going to do is I'm going to go to um, in the site here. Um, sign the agreements by checking them into your sites. Uh, there's an agreement for students. Um, there's an agreement for instructors. And there's an agreement for labs. I'm going to post that issue. So the issue, um, you should get an email message. And then there's a list of issues. And this is one of the ways we're going to communicate. Um, and uh, in these agreements, it describes what the Fab Academy is responsible for. And then it describes what you're responsible for. And I won't go through each line in detail now, but each of these is important. E each of these reflects um, what we expect and they reflect historical issues. And so um, I'm going to explain what does it mean to commit these in the repository, but uh, each student lab and instructor um, needs to do their assign, uh, do the agreements as part of this week. Um, Let's see, Julian is asking me about, um, oh, Julian, uh, let's see, is it, did I put that in the wrong project? Uh, um, students have access to the class repo. Oh, okay. Um, oh, it's the class repo, not the site repo. Uh, correct? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll explain all of this in, in a moment when, when we descend into this. So um, let's go back to here. Let's 
we respectively Uh, okay. It's all public, but here the students can also create issues. Great. Okay. Good. Okay. So let me explain all of that. So uh, how do you build a website? So uh, this first item is file synchronization. You're likely not to use this, but I want to mention it. Um, uh, what rsync does it's an open source tool and if i have files on one computer and i want to mirror them on another computer it's a very efficient way to do it rather than copying all the files it only copies the files that have changed and so this is a tool i use for backups for example when i have a server and i want to back it up it'll up copy just the changes to another server for backup but all it does is copy the files. Uh, what version control does is something that's much more profound. Um, version control manages history. So when you're working on a project, you might have a current version of it. Um, you might have a test version where you're trying out a new idea. You might have a version that for use in another language, say, and then you might be working with multiple people. Some, somebody's working on part of the hardware, somebody on the code. So what version control systems do is rather than just the current files, they manage the history of them. Um, they manage, you might be working on multiple different systems and you need to coordinate the changes. And there are multiple people working. And so, learning to use a version control system is one of the key skills in the class this is history of them uh, we'll be using git which is largely one for version control so git is an open source version control system it it's named for linus torvalds who's uh the core developer of linux and in british english git is an annoying person and Linus named this after himself as an annoying person that he, he proudly embraces. Um, uh, to use Git, there are multiple ways you can do it. You can use it um, in a web browser, but you can also use it locally. So um, GitHub, you might be familiar with, is a platform for people using Git to share projects. Um, that's commercial, it was bought, even if the projects are open, the platform is proprietary, it was bought by Microsoft. Um, GitLab is an open source platform. They have a commercial service, but it's an open source platform. And that's what we're gonna be using to manage content. Uh, and so a big part of the class, um, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna come back to this page is how you use it. So if we go back into, um, you each have a login to Fab Cloud, which is a, um, a GitLab instance. Um, each of these is a um, repository, which is a set of files with history. And then uh, these are groups. So each student, if we go to the class site, um, each of you has a starting site. So this is what it looks like on the web. Um, if we go into the labs and um, uh, well, we can really take anyone. If we go into the labs and then the students, um, this is what the site looks like on the web and then these are all the files in the site so from this web interface you can open and edit these files but one of the key skills is rather than having to edit on the server you can use git to pull all of this onto your local computer work on the local computer 
when you're happy, then you can push it back to the server. And in the class cycle, the um, recitation on um, uh, the 30th, which is Monday, uh, nine o'clock Boston time, uh, Julian's going to take what I'm going to tour now and spend an hour in more detail on all of this. Um, yeah, let's see, there's a note from Jason about open source. In uh, a little bit further out, I'll, I'll, in this class, I'll talk a lot about licenses and open and closed sources and, and, and types of licenses. Um, so let's come back to uh, project management. Um, Git is what you're going to be using to manage your content. Then once you learn, well, actually, let, let me let me spend a little time on this before I go on. And um, once I talk about Git, I'll then talk about web development. So this link, the first thing it links to is uh, GitLab to learn about it. And we're, GitLab does many things for us. It manages the repositories. A repository is your current files and their history. It provides a web interface for us to see how to use it. It provides um, issue trackers, which are things we use to manage issues. Like um, in the, uh, the first issue I posted was um, you signing your assignments. If we go back to last year, 2022, and if we go into the um, class, Uh, you'll see all of these issues of questions. These are ways to communicate uh, with our, um, uh, so it's a way to ask and get answers. Um, GitLab provides workflows, and in this case, it's to publish your websites. It provides wikis, which I'll talk about, and it does some more advanced project things I'll talk about. It lets you manage milestones and do Kanban, what are called Kanban boards. Uh, Git, you won't learn just by staring at it. So this is a tutorial and I, from Git, and I recommend going through the tutorial. Um, here's a good guide to using Git. Um, there's a, this is a nice book on it. Um, this is a fun story about using Git. And then uh, Dangit is a nice site about uh, dealing with Git problems. So. One of the assignments for this week is to work through one of the tutorials. Now, to start, you can use Git just by using the web browser. But then what you can do is you can install it locally. So um, you can, there's a package for Mac. There's a package for Windows. Um, there's a package for Linux. And what that lets you do is instead of having to do all your editing through the web browser, you can use whatever tool you like on your local computer. So you pull the work down, you work locally, and then you push it back. Um, you can also do it uh, on a mobile phone. So this is a uh, Termux, which lets you do it on your phone. And in fact, my whole life lives in Git on my phone. Each day I pull a repository that has my calendar and my address book and everything I need to do. And then I work on my phone. And at the end of the day, I push it all back to a server. And same thing for iOS. So what this is doing is it's maintaining the history. It's managing changes. It's letting you share work with other people. And it's letting you remotely do things uh, onto and off of a server. So that's what we'll do with Git. Uh, I'll come back at the end of the class to talk about some of the mistakes and some of the commands. Okay. So once you're set up with that, as a beginner, initially, you'll just work through this web interface. So again, 2023, if we go back to labs, you can click into your lab, and then um, there are the student templates. And then from in here, you can just edit the files directly. But then pretty quickly, you want to progress beyond the web interface and be able to work on your local computer. 
So then the next thing you need to do is you're going to build websites. Each of you has a starting site. If we go back again to each of you has just this um, template of a site that you can start with. And by the end, you're going to build beautiful sites. So if we go back to the examples, um, any one of these examples um, uh, it, uh, it is a good starting place to, to see if we take, um, uh, so here's a nice website um, that describes the weekly projects, the final projects. Uh, uh, it describes, uh, in this case, Elena. Uh, you each will, over time, build these beautiful sites as you progress. So how do you build a website? Uh, in a week, you're not going to master it. In a week, all we want you to do is just begin to learn to start editing. And in the coming weeks, you'll get better and better. So. Web pages like the one you're looking at are served by web servers. Uh, Nginx and Apache are the most common ones. They send the web page to the web browser. Um, but you can also run web servers locally, and you can view web pages locally just by opening them as a raw file. So when you're working on your web pages, uh, you can use these to view the web pages before you push them on the server. Web is standardized by this body, uh, spun off from MIT. HTML is the language you use to describe web pages. Um, uh, and then uh, MDN is Mozilla Developer Network, which is a really good uh, reference for it. From HTML, there's a number of extensions that we'll be using. HTML5 adds video, for example, to it. Um, uh, this is a site of web uh, uh, templates for web pages. One of the most useful things you can do as you're getting started, um, uh, so there's a note about ChatGPT. Uh, ChatGPT is going to be a big topic. We're going to talk about uh, AI for design. We'll talk about AI for coding. I, you could also use it to make web pages, but in coming weeks, we'll talk about uh, the uh, impact of AI tools. Uh, one of the most useful things you can do is uh, from the browser, you can view source or control U um, is a shortcut. So here's a web page. Uh, this is the HTML. So this says it's a web page. Here's the body. This says make it bold and italics. This says align it in the center. This is indenting it. Um, so viewing source is a good thing while you're learning just to get used to looking at uh, the web pages. There's uh, many different levels you can work at. So these are ancient editors dating back uh, to early days of computing. Um, but they're still commonly used. I make a lot of use of uh, VI. It's just a raw text editor. So when I, the lowest level to make a web page is I just edit these codes directly. And uh, then um, all of these, Atom VS Code, um, these are all more modern editors that um, help you. So uh, when you're making a web page, they help with understanding what the codes are. Um, when you're writing computer code, they help with looking up the computer code. Um, uh, these add more graphical assists. On the other hand, the reason I like these low-level editors is they date back before complex graphics, so you can use them without having to keep reaching for a mouse. But these are more, more powerful editors. Then. A level above that are these projects. So LibreOffice is an open source suite, like the Microsoft Office suite. And one of its tools is um, LibreOffice Web that lets you, in a graphical environment, like a word processor, make web pages. Uh, CMonkey is a similar tool like that. Um, and this is a commercial tool. Those let you build web pages without looking at the codes. 
on the one hand, that's very friendly. On the other hand, they generally make pretty ugly HTML that's hard to edit directly. So if you start with them, you have to stay with them or you can um, edit below it. Then uh, for interactivity in web pages, we use that by writing JavaScript. And I'm not going to talk much about that now. In the class, when we get to this class on building interfaces and applications, I'll talk much more about um, JavaScript for web programming. Then a level higher still is um, Markdown is a shorthand language that lets you describe web pages without having to write all those codes, just by writing uh, simple text formatting. Then from Markdown, Hugel, Jekyll, ViewPress, MKDocs, these are all tools that let you build not a page, but a site. And so rather than writing raw HTML codes, you write uh, Markdown formatting. And these let you take a series of Markdown docs and assemble them into building a site. And so what you've been given is a very simple HTML template to start. Um, if you want, you can progress to using one of these. And some of your sites, there are different opinions in different sites. Some of your sites will help you pick if you want to use one of these for site management. And then, um, YAML is one more thing. So if we go into a student site, um, in, in the um, student site, um, there's, a, oh, let's see, that one doesn't look right. Let me do another one. Um, if we go into, <coughs> excuse me, to a um, student site, let's do students. Um, there's, this is what's called a YAML file. And what this does is it has the rules that takes your website and this is how the server knows how to publish it and make it readable. So to build your website, what I would do is I would browse past years. If you go to the class page, uh, you can go in prior years and you can um, see if you, for example, look at the thumbnails, you can see all the projects from all this uh, prior students and look at their sites. Another thing on the class site is there's a search engine. So if you're interested in drones, you can find all the class projects that were on drones or skateboards or skis. Um, and so you can use those to look for ideas on websites. And what I would recommend for this week is start by making simple edits on the site template to fill it in learn about some of these site generators. And then in the coming weeks, um, you'll fill in more on your site. So that's writing just uh, web pages. Then uh, all of these are ways to manage um, uh, platforms beyond that. And so in uh, GitLab, each of the repositories we're using, or we, we can pick any of them, in addition to the files has an associated uh, wiki with it. And so you can use the wiki as a way to mark up information on a site, and you could use those to uh, publish your work for the class. And then these things are complete content management systems. And you might be familiar with something like this that you could have used in a school. Uh, we don't use these because they tend to restrict how you present your work. By having each of you build a website from scratch, uh, it's much more expressive and it's much more uh, personal. So 
Uh, you don't need to use any of these, but you can use these to manage the content um, across your site. Then you may be familiar with Slack as a tool for collaboration. Uh, GitLab has linked to it Mattermost, which is an open source alternative. And so if you go to chat.academeni.org, you can log into that with your uh, FabCloud login. And uh, the I issues in GitLab are really just that. I have a problem, here's how to solve it. Um, we use Mattermost for conversations. And so uh, for 2023, for town square is an open one for everyone. Uh, this is a conversation for uh, instructors. This is kind of a none of the above. Uh, you can start conversations with people individually. You can add more channels. Uh, this is what we use to have conversations. Um, this is, for example, about the, the prep student bootcamp. And so we'll be using the issue tracker in GitLab to solve problems and ask questions. We'll be using Mattermost for more freeform conversations. But what's nice about it is it's, it's joined at the hip. It's linked to GitLab, so they can each uh, point into each other. Uh, this next group, um, let's see, Yasin is asking about Jimdo. I'm not familiar with Jim, Jim, sorry, Jimdo. Um, you can use whatever tool you want. So that looks like a website builder. You can use whatever tool you want to build your website with the one limitation that at the end, it has to produce HTML files that go in the repository. Um, all of your work stays in the repository because it lets us manage, supervise it, and then it lets us archive it. So we, we don't want your content linking outside, but as long as you can produce HTML files, you can use um, any tool, tool you want to produce them. And this is typical. Each week, I won't tell you the way to do something. I'll give you a number of options, both commercial and open source. Uh, and uh, there's typically a range of uh, opinions on who uses what. So all of this stuff is historical. Uh, years ago, if we go into CBA, um, uh, I used to run our own video infrastructure before there were things like Zoom. And then in this class, we had to cover how you connect to it. Uh, it, it, now in the world of uh, tools like Zoom, we don't need that anymore. But the one, the one thing, or a few things I would add here is what you're using right now under the hood, as I'm talking to you, is WebRTC. This is the extension for web that lets you do video conferencing over the web. You can use that program it directly and a really nice project is Jitsi. Um, Jitsi is a kind of a peer-to-peer -peer video conferencing that lets you use WebRTC to spin up meetings without going through a commercial service like um, Zoom. And then uh, OBS Studio is a really handy tool. Um, uh, let's see, Fran is adding a link to this. Uh, Fran, what's FMCU? Yes, yeah, so this is the Frankenstein M uh, Frankenstein MCU that we are going to develop. So it will show which labs are connected to Zoom. Oh, so nice. it's the lab connected to Fab Academy. Yeah. Oh, this is great. This came up in the boot camp in the early days of the MCU when video was new. We would all connect to it even when we weren't in class, just to hang out and see each other. And we wanted to make an interface to it. So Fran, that's great. That's progressing. Um, keep, keep updating. Yeah, really, yeah you, can, you can spin the globe. Um, keep, keep, keep updating us on this as you progress. That's great. That's wonderful. Very cool. Um, OBS is a really great thing to know about. OBS turns your computer into a production studio. So what it does is 
rather than just having a speaker and a camera, you can take any source on your computer and send it out as audio and video or take any source coming in and use it. And then it lets you manage switching among them, uh, transitions, formatting multiple things. And so from just having a computer, a, a camera and a speaker, OBS is a really powerful open uh, project that turns your computer into a studio. Uh, next topic is we don't need this yet, but some of the things I'm going to be doing with you, I need to show you a computer. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to start remote desktops that I view from a browser. And so this is a link to um, a number of different scripts to start up uh, remote servers that you can then view in a browser and get access to uh, other kinds of computing resources. Later on, I'll talk about when you need a computer with more memory or more powerful processors, um, you can use that to remotely manage servers. We won't use that. Um, we don't need that yet. Likewise, in the interface class, I'll talk more about um, cloud computing. Uh, next thing to talk about is These are all versions of open tools that make pictures like these. And what that's for is for a one week assignment, you just have one task. But for your final project, there are multiple tasks. And for the machine building, there's going to be multiple people doing multiple tasks. And they have complex dependencies. So these are tools that let you manage tasks of what has to happen in what order, how is it progressing who's doing what. Um, and so you don't need that for one person on one task, but you do need that for many person on, people on many tasks. And again, one of the core things GitLab does is tools for that uh, task management. So if we go back into, uh, this is the repository for the class site. Um, uh, the, um, uh, in here, in addition to the issue tracker, um, Kanban boards let you make a series of steps where it's like moving sticky notes on a board to follow a task. A service desk is responding to issues. Um, milestones are tracking who has to do what. So um, GitLab has a lot of that built in. Um, let's see, there's um, in the chat a link to this um, uh, that's written in WebAssembly. Uh, yeah, I'll add a link. Uh, WebAssembly is a way to compile for websites. And I'll, I'll talk more about that when we get to interface and application programming. So initially, you won't be using these project management tools, uh, but you'll grow into them as the project gets more complex. Uh, now. At the end, when we get to final projects, oops, I'm going to talk about um, uh, project management. And at the beginning, I'll talk a little bit about project management. So let me pull up a tablet. So what I'm going to describe now will sound obvious. But each of these has led to billions of dollars of mistakes and giant failures. So one thing, yeah, so a, a good name for the class we're doing is how to make almost anything. A bad name is how to almost make almost anything. That you're going to be failing often and learning to deal with time management and fixing uh, failure. So one really important principle is demand versus supply side time. Uh, demand is for this week, you like you start by learning Git, um, then you start by learning some HTML, then you start by building a website, um, and then you uh, work on getting it on the server, except uh, this is next Wednesday, and so you didn't finish in time. 
Demand side is where you do each task in turn. Um, supply side time is if this is now and this is Wednesday, you work back in advance and you figure out how much time you can spend on each task. And so you have a day on learning Git, a day on starting HTML, a day on building the site, a day on getting it on the server. You make a plan in advance on how you're going to spend time and work back from it. And you can really learn to work to the schedule rather than the task. So one key skill is planning tasks based on time rather than hoping you finish in time. Um, triage, and you saw some of that in the project reviews, is when there's, say, a big accident and a plane crashes, there's some people who are injured but get up and walk away, and they're stable. You don't need to worry about them. There are some people, even though it's sad, who are so close to dying you can't save them. And then you need to find the people in between where your intervention will make a difference. Um, the same thing is going to happen to your projects. There's some parts of your projects that are just fine. There's some parts of your project that are hopeless, and you need to give up on them and you need to find the ones to focus on. And so you can spend too much time on something that'll never work. And so triage is important. Um, serial development is like what I've been doing, where you do a task and then a task and a task and a task. But if this task gets stuck, you never get to these tasks. Um, parallel development is where you're working the tasks in parallel. So even if one task gets stuck, you can keep working on the other ones. And so you want to keep a parallel series of tasks going. So rather than doing each one in turn. Uh, spiral development is something you're going to hear me say over and over. Uh, the, in big government contracting, there was a problem where there'd be the government would spend 10 years and a billion dollars, get to the end, and find what they made doesn't work. Spiral development is you work in larger and larger spirals, but each time you come back. So, like, let's say you wanted to make a drone. The first spiral would be to make a drone that can't fly, but is just, but has the, the, the structure. A second spiral would be to make the drone, but um, it's wired rather than wireless. A third one would be to make the drone and it's wireless, but it doesn't yet have um, uh, feedback controls. A, a fourth one is now it's stable and flies autonomously. Each spiral around, you end up with a drone, but each time you add more and more to it. So you keep testing by working in spirals. And that's something that you'll hear uh, me talk about over and over. Um, you're going to be doing a lot of debugging, and we're going to have a recitation. Um, uh, let's see. It, in the chat, there's more on um, love of this site. Um, on how watches work. Oh, th this is beautiful. Oh, I see, and this, 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 oh, good Lord, this, this, this is huge. Wow. Okay, that's gorgeous. Um, you're gonna spend a lot of time in the class with broken things and meaning with things that aren't working and um, we're going to have a recitation on debugging but an important principle is when something's broken uh, you have to either start from the bottom or the top um, top down is you take something broken and bit by bit you remove things until it starts working bottom up is you start with simple things that work separately and build them up uh, in complexity. And that leads to an important principle in the class is going to be hierarchy and modularity. If you try to do a big project in one go, it can just fail. If you break the project into small modules, you can develop and test them separately and combine them. 
this one is each week you're guaranteed to run out of time. And so if you work and then document, the consistent result is you'll fail to document. Um, so instead, you need to get in the habit of documenting as you work. Uh, and so uh, each work session, do some work, build some documentation. And um, you know, if we go back to, uh, let's see. Um, I, I see a Adrian just happens to be on, on the window closest to the browser. So here's Adrian's page for the electronics design. And if you go through it, it's like a notebook. As he's working, um, he's logging um, his work, uh, following what he's learned, what he did, um, including all the links to reproduce his work. Um, and then ending up with uh, demonstrations of how it's working. And so that's what you should be doing each week is don't build a web page at the very end, keep it as a notebook um, and document as it works. Um, let's see, can I sing that, Neil? <laughs> I, I'll leave that to the puppet. Um, this is a really interesting book I recommend. This was one of the best books on project management. It's by the person who managed the IBM 360 project. And it's full of great insights. Like one of my favorite one is a pregnancy takes nine months, no matter how many women you assign to it. Meaning there are some tasks you can't accelerate just by adding labor. It's full of really good insights into project management. So each of these skills, you'll hear me talk about them each week. They sound kind of obvious, but each the failure of each of these have led to significant uh, catastrophes in large scale project management. And implicitly, one of the things we're going to be doing is uh, learning project management through this weekly cycle. So now let me step back and drill in a little bit more on uh, Git. So once again, uh, here, let me do a live example. If we take 2023 students, let's see, Anoop. Oh, I see, Anoop has already made uh, progress. Uh, that's great. Um, uh, uh, let me take somebody who just has a template. So Saskia. Um, so if I go into, um, GitLab, and we go to um, labs. Uh, this is uh, Alto. Then students. Then Saskia, and then. Um, Oh, sorry, the... we, we just put Hugo on it already. So that's oh, it's, I not, see. Okay. it's not playing HTML anymore. I see. Okay. Uh, so um, Alto is already ahead of me. The um, uh, Let's see. We're doing okay for time. Yeah. So let me stay with it. So um, uh, Chris already added um, uh, one of the markdowns. Let me take um, somebody with a, oh, actually, Quite a few, this is funny, quite, quite a few of you are making, actually, yeah, let me not do this live then, quite a, quite a few of our, are, are ahead of me. What, what I was going to do is show you um, just simply, um, oh, sorry, Julian, that is the template that I was looking at. Yep, with that bar, that's. <laughs> sorry, which is the template? This, this one. Yeah, okay. well, this, yeah, it, it looks a bit like this has already had a few links added, but yeah. Okay, um, so let, let, let's do uh, Adam and Charlotte. So um, if we go to labs, Charlotte, students, Adam. Yeah, Adam's already made a few changes, but it looks nearly the same. Okay, so just the index that, so 
here's Adam's. Um, this is Adam's site. Um, so I'm going to open it in the web IDE. So here are all his files. And then I can come here and edit. So I'm just going to say, uh, I'm going to add a heading. And I'm going to say, Neil says hello. So I just added a, a little bit of um, HTML to here. Then committing is like taking a snapshot. It's like taking a picture. Um, branches are, you can have multiple versions. I don't need to make a branch. And so I'm going to commit that. Then if I go back to its site, there's a little rocket ship. And um, this tells me right now it's running. And so it, it's, uh, it just finished running the site to publish it. And that one went very quickly. And so if we come here to his web page, Let's see, has it not checked out yet, Julian? Okay, there, good. So uh, I just edited his, let's see, Adam, are you in Charlotte? Neil, Adam's not in Charlotte. He's probably Charlotte. teaching a class right now. Okay. But no, you can let no, him I'm know. here. I, I don't oh, have a class. Sure. Sorry, I just had to oh. unmute. Okay, so hi, hi, Adam. J just to meet the person Hello. I'm editing. So um, I'm I write just- a message back. <laughs> okay, so I just went in with the web interface and I did a little edit on Adam's website. Um, now, if we go to um, Adam's repository here, um, what you can see is so far there's three commits. This is where Julian set it up. Um, and then uh, Adam, I can see, already made a few edits. And then uh, here's my edit. And we can go here and we can see exactly what Adam did that week. This is part of the history in Git. Um, here, right now, this is running in a straight line. But one of the things you can do in Git is branch and merge. So um, uh, you can start editing. And then you can branch another version. And this could be on a different computer or a different person. Editing continues along here. And then you merge the changes back in. You won't need that initially when you're just working by yourself, but you'll grow into needing that. So all of that was editing the website just from the web interface. And in fact, um, uh, Adam just responded to me. Um, by doing a hello back. And it takes a minute. Uh, you can see this here. One, once you've uh, run it, it takes a minute for the server um, to uh, publish it. Uh, but a Adam responded back to me. So at, as a beginner, that's all you need to do. You can do it with the web interface. But you're very quickly going to reach the limit of that. And so what I want you to do is learn how to do it locally. And so um, let's see, Julian, you're saying show the pipeline. What is that? Yeah, that's so how you see that after you uh, commit, you'll have uh, to wait till it builds it. Uh, right. So if we go back to um, Charlotte, Latin students, Adam, uh, if we look at the little rocket ship, the pipeline shows you, if we come in here, um, it first does this job. This is what it's actually doing under the hood to build your site. And then um, this is what it's doing to publish the site. And if we come over here, finally, we can see Adam said hello back to me. So uh, it, not initially as a beginner, but what you want to get set up is to install Git locally. So you pull the work off of the server, and then you can use all of your favorite tools on your local computer and then you can push the work back to the server. And so um, you can use Git with a, a GUI. And so these are examples of now, these are running locally on your computer, not on the server, but they let you do all the tasks in um, Git. They let you branch and merge and commit. Um, or you can do Git just from a terminal. And the more experienced you get, the more you're likely to do it in a terminal, because just a little bit of typing replaces a lot of 
of clicking. And so um, this, don't, don't worry about learning this right away, but this is a cheat sheet of Git can give you help. Um, you can tell Git who you are. Um, something I suggest you do is you don't need the server. You can work locally. So you can create your own Git repository. Um, cloning is how you pull work down from the server. Um, pulling is where you get new work. Pushing is where you send it back. Um, this is where you tell Git what to track. This is to tell Git what it thinks it's going to do. A commit is where um, you're working and you stop and you ask Git to store that part of the history. Um, these are things to move. Um, these are tools for branching and merging. And these are some more advanced things. And this lets you recursively go through all your Git repos. You won't need that to begin, but as you get better and better at Git, you'll start using these commands. And then these are just some shortcuts. You'll see me use these. Um, these are just like a few characters I use as shortcuts for commonly used um, Git commands. Now, there's a number of issues you're going to run into. When you start to do this locally, um, you're going to have cryptographic keys. And Julian will talk about that. You have to get that set up properly. Um, it's very important you check what you're going to commit before you commit it. And so you, you don't want to, for example, commit a directory of raw pictures. You want to commit only the edited ones for the web. So you always want to check what you do before you commit. Um, before you push, you need to pull and merge. You need to refresh your browser. You need to be aware it takes some time for the server to finish. Um, uh, you want relative links are locally pointing to a file rather than the complete path to it on the server. Again, many of these won't make sense to start. You'll learn as you go. You don't use spaces in file names because they're problematical on the web. Um, it's best to use um, uh, what are called ASCII characters, Unicode or more general character sets, but they're problems on the web. Um, some servers do and some don't care about uppercase versus lowercase. And then we want all of your work in repositories so that we can maintain it. Now, one of the uh, issues we're going to run into, and I'll be doing this each class, is you should be generating roughly megabytes of data a week uh, um, for, for the size of your repositories. And so a, a full frame picture from a very high resolution camera is a gigabyte. Um, we can't afford the storage for gigabytes each week, each person. But it's not only that. It takes a long time to load. It takes a lot of space for you to store it. And it's very unfriendly to anybody viewing the web. And so a key skill is, and I'm going to talk about this next week, is going to be compression. So DU and NCDU are tools you'll see me use to check file size. And next week, I'll talk about how you use um, tools like GIMP and ImageMagick to compress your image. Um, you saw this in the video with the puppets. We use PNGs when you don't want compression for things like engineering files. But for web images, we want JPEGs that let you compress it. And you saw me mention this in the projects. For videos, you, um, you also want to compress them down. So you generate megabytes per week. It's very easy to slip and generate um, much larger files than that that wastes space on the server, and it's unfriendly to your viewer. Uh, for the first few classes, I'll be monitoring your usage, and I'll show use of these tools uh, uh, to help you manage size. And so these are all, the compression is an important one as you start generating content. And then these other ones you'll learn as you move from using Git on the server to using it locally. Uh, it is on the one hand, compared to all the things we're going to cover in this class, learning to use version control isn't the most exciting. On the other hand, it's one of the most important skills you're going to learn. My whole life is in version control. Everything I do, 
uh, goes into these version control systems. So it is a key skill you'll be learning. Not the most exciting one, but one of the most important ones. Uh, and so for this week, take a Git tutorial. Again, if we go back to the class archive, um, I have linked here a number of tutorials. There's no way to avoid it. Just these concepts of branching and merging and conflicts won't make sense unless you do a tutorial. Then Julian's given you a starting site. Um, you don't need, if, if, if you're not sure what to do, stay with his template. If you already know enough about the web, you can move beyond it. Later on, you could move beyond it. But start, start building a site to describe you. And at this stage, just come up with a, an initial idea for the final project. The final project will change, most likely, but it's good to have a project in mind for a starting idea for the final project. And then um, check it in. And starting next week, I'll start the random generator and start meeting you. And so I'll pick people to uh, check your work for the week, talk through your problems and successes, and then learn about you and your lab. And then the other task I want you to do is, if we go back to um, here, if you, uh, Fab Academy 2023, if you go into the site doc, I'd like each student, lab, and instructor, what you do is add your name and then check the file in, and that's how you sign it. And then just briefly, um, these are all the things the Fab Academy is responsible for. And then as students, we want you to come to classes and the reviews, uh, develop and document your work. Um, we'll share your work with attribution on our class sites. Um, you need to report what you did, where anything came from, and what you used, and which includes both people and machines. And I'll talk much more about AI. Um, safety is going to become much more important as we get to more dangerous machines. We need you to help with housekeeping in your labs and maintain them. Um, obviously, you need to just cover the costs for local and central, um, follow health and safety. And it's very important. We want labs to be respectful um, and not discriminate. And it's important that you help us contribute to that. Um, Jason is talking about an MIT video on Git. I don't think I know that. MIT missing semester Git. Oh, interesting. Um, I'm adding a note. I wasn't familiar with that. I'll, I'll add a link to that. That looks interesting. Okay, we're almost at the end of time. Are there any questions or comments? Let's see, Jason is asking, is there a way to find out the size of a git commit? Um, git itself doesn't tell you the size, but um, uh, what you do want to, what I would use is, um, and I make a lot of use of, um, du is a command line, ncdu um, is sort of a text terminal GUI. Those let you walk through file trees to see uh, file sizes. Um, and so I use those to check file sizes. Um, Safe is asking about how to find the tutorial. If you go to project management class archive, um, this line is a series of Git tutorials. Um, Haley is asking time. Um, Haley, we link the schedule to nine o'clock in Boston, and there's two reasons we do that. Um, the reason to, to anchor it to Boston is that ranges from six o'clock on the West Coast to um, 2300 in Japan. Unfortunately, we miss um, New Zealand. Part of Pacifica is in the middle of the night, but this is one time that's a good time for most time zones. Uh, and the other thing is the reason we stick with nine o'clock in Boston is 
when daylight savings time flips, there's a very annoying few weeks where different parts of the world do or don't change time zones with daylight savings. And so that's why we keep it nine o'clock in Boston to follow um, changes in time zones. Let's see, Claire, are you in Australia right now at four in the morning? Uh, it, it, if you are, congratulations. I'm impressed uh, for the people staying up at four in the morning. I'm, I'm sorry that we end up in the middle of the night for you, but we've ended up with this time that covers most of the planet. That's but, uh, all right. <laughs> I mean, it's all good here <laughs> okay. in uh, good. nice Australia. <laughs> good, 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 good. Thank you for e either staying up, uh, see, e either late or early. It's hard, hard to tell at that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So then, from here, uh, Saturday at 10 is the global open time. And it's a real labor of love from the team hosting it that can help you with absolutely everything. The, the class is pretty dense and pretty busy. This is a great open time. And then um, uh, uh, the, the, the Monday recitation, no, th those are only one hour. Sorry, uh, Hefi, I should ex explain. The recitations are just one hour. Uh, so nine to 10 Boston. And Julian is gonna spend an hour just working through in detail what I skimmed pretty quickly on version control. So once again, you're not mentioned, um, oh boy, uh, Pablo is asking about AI for code. Let me talk about that in a few weeks. Uh, uh, AI for code is a, a rapidly changing subject. It's powerful. We will talk about using it. On the other hand, it's also dangerous and makes mistakes and the AI systems hallucinate and they also infringe. And so it's a very complex subject I'll talk more about. So in the next week, you're not gonna master Git and version control. You're just gonna get started, but be ready to have a, a starting site and then we'll start the cycle. Next week, we begin technical content with the design tools. And then in two weeks, we get in the lab and we start making stuff. So with that, we're now underway. Uh, each week, the videos currently linked are from last year. And each week after the class, I'll uh, be transcoding them and posting them. And then I'll be linking the reviews when we start them beginning next week. So I look forward to meeting all of you seeing what you do. There's a wonderful transformation as this global group really becomes a community. Uh, celebrate your work through the semester and then meet you all in person in Bhutan this summer. And a final tradition is at the end of class, we all say goodbye in our local language. So bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.